Thank you. So we're changing topics a little bit from high level vision uh, of where the industry can be to some of the details of modeling. Uh, but it's a subject I love and hopefully that, that comes out uh, here today. So I always like to talk about modeling by, by saying uh, painting the big picture. Uh, so uh, floating wind is, is one of these areas where it's, uh, there's a lot of great industrial experience on the turbine side, a lot of great industrial experience on the on floating platform side, and we're trying to bridge that gap. So we don't have necessarily just the turbine, we don't have an offshore structure, really have, we have a combined system and that's where the, the challenges lie. Um, modeling. Uh, I love this, this was actually a, a slide that Scott Shrek, my colleague at Enrel, put together, just talking about the, the scale and the fluids problem. Uh, aerodynamically, uh, <clears throat> it's really a, a 10 order of magnitude uh, difference in scales of, of where things can interact. And you can perhaps draw some breakpoints between why well, I'm focused on this or I'm focused on this. Uh, but in the end, there's coupling between those systems. And uh, clearly, if you want to do, do this uh, and capture all the physics, you're going to have to make some assumption because you can't, you can't do it. There's not enough competing power to, to solve the, the full couple problems. We have to simplify things down a bit. Uh, these are some of my, famous, uh, my favorite modeling quotes uh, as a modeler. Uh, Einstein said a model should be as simple as possible, but not simpler. Uh, and George Box, a little skeptic here, but saying essentially, essentially all models are wrong, uh, but some are useful. And we're trying to bridge that gap uh, between, uh, again, trying to capture what we need to and making sure it's, it's useful uh, for our needs. So uh, this is kind of what, what I've been pushing uh, at, at NREL uh, and, 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 uh, and trying to get a community around this is that the engineering tools that we need to actually do a physical structural design are really uh, bridging the gap between uh, theory on one side, obviously we, we need to make tools based on actual reality, uh, uh, testing, experimentation, and high fidelity simulation. We're trying to, trying to break the knowledge from all three areas into a tool set that we can actually use for design. Uh, so we need to capture, of course, the physics that are important to the problem. We need to uh, have the fidelity needed for whatever uh, specific design uh, you're doing. So we need, we need a framework by which we can, we can have high fidelity here, we can have low fidelity here, just based on what application uh, you have. In the end, if you're doing engineering design, we need to cover the environmental conditions and the operational behavior of the system over the lifetime. So we need a, to have a, a tool in the end that's also efficient to cover a lot of probabilistic uh, sort of design uh, situations. Uh, the mainstay in the industry is obviously nonlinear time domain uh, simulation, uh, very useful for loads type analysis. We also need linearization capability uh, to do things like uh, calculating uh, eigen modes, uh, doing controls design, doing uh, stability calculations, and also simply having gradients you need for your optimization loops. Uh, we need to support uh, new technology. So if there's something new uh, out there, you're introducing a new mooring system, a new blade, a new sensor, uh, we need to have models that capture the, the important physics in those uh, systems. And finally, because these tools are not, again, fully predictive, high fidelity CFD simulations, uh, we need to do a lot of verification against other tools uh, where, they, where they apply and also validation to figure out where they are valid and where they're not. A little bit about some of the basic challenges that I, I think uh, uh, we're facing at the moment. These are obviously again a floating wind turbine is not just a turbine, it's not just an offshore structure. So these are kind of the core kind of wind technology uh, challenges that that uh, we're facing in the industry. Uh, these systems are becoming very very large. A lot of the standards were, were designed around uh, systems that were much much smaller. We had a much better handle what the aerodynamic uh, inflow was to those systems. Uh, now we're talking about very very large you know, 100 plus meter diameter rotors where the inflow uh, is not as simple as discrete gusts and some turbulence. So we have a, a very uh, 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 impact of things like stability and so on that we have to consider in the analysis of the inflow. Obviously, there, uh, if you look at these aeroelastic simulations, the biggest weakness of the models is on the aerodynamic side. That's where a lot of the, uh, the calibrations and tuning happens. Um, as these machines get larger, uh, very large flexibility, nonlinearity in the structures, the composite coupling is, is, uh, is very important. Uh, that's one of my favorite pictures from, from Kenneth Thompson out of Siemens, just showing the, uh, the evolution of blade design from where it was in the 90s uh, to where it is today. Uh, obviously the blade is a lot longer, but uh, on the same scale, uh, obviously a lot of innovation has happened, taking material out of that blade uh, to make it cost effective. 
Uh, controls is obviously uh, a very important subject. Uh, Matt will talk a bit about more of the innovations there uh, today, both passive and active in these large systems. Uh, there's, of course, the interaction of turbines uh, with a grid. Uh, often um, in turbine design, we simplify the electrical uh, piece and, and we minimize coupling. But as these systems get larger, with potentially more uh, coupling interactions with the grid that we have to consider. Uh, wake and ray effects is a big focus right now in the Department of Energy. Uh, how do we design not just turbines, but turbines that are going to interact at a plant level uh, interaction uh, on the wakes and rays, controls, and so on. Again, we have to analyze turbines that, that uh, over their lifetime, so we have to consider what the high, highest loads that the system is going to experience, what the fatigue loads, uh, make sure it's stable across the lifetime, and I'll build this in a, in a framework that has systems engineering, uh, economics, uh, and engineering and optimization uh, built together. On the offshore side, uh, there's a whole host of new uh, challenges just because you're placing a turbine on an offshore platform. Uh, of course, just like wind, we have a lot large variety of sea state uh, conditions, uh, uh, both uh, uh, stochastic and, and extreme extreme wave conditions, currents. Of course, the interaction of those hydrodynamics with floater. Uh, one problem we face in the design process is that normally a turbine engineer thinks of wind as a stationary process in about 10 minutes to one hour sort of uh, condition, whereas in an offshore setting, people think of stationarity as a, kind of a you know one hour to 12 hour uh, stationary process. And when we do stochastic simulations, we need to somehow bridge that gap. And how do we actually treat the stationarity of the of the flow to do our design simulations? Uh, tropical cyclones is the whole. Uh, topic that that has not been explored uh, much so far. What are the real, real physics, not just on waves and, and wind, but how they get coupled and, and how is that going to lead to structural design uh, changes in the turbines? Huge problem we're facing in floating offshore wind and offshore wind in general uh, is is this intract, intractable, uh, what I call nine plus dimensional uh, stochastic design space. So wind energy, wind, wind turbines, you think of the variation of wind speed and perhaps variation of turbulence intensity beyond that. Some, t some even go to three dimensions considering shear effects and so on. But in, in the offshore setting, uh, we also have, of course, the, the variation of wave heights, periods, uh, current. There's, of course, the directionality between wind, wave, and current. If you add all those up, of course, there's tides and surges as well. If you add all those up, it's over a nine-dimensional probabilistic design space. And uh, if you just simply do a, a full you know, matrix of you know, bin, bin conditions, uh, you're going to be very patient in, in every design loop. So we have to figure out ways of, of somehow uh, figuring out the important process. What, what, what in this space is, is critical to design? Likely it probably depends on the system and the site conditions. Uh, of course, when you install a turbine on a floating platform, you introduce new compliance in six degrees of freedom. So you have low frequency modes that never existed before. You have uh, potentially large displacements of the structure. Um, and that can couple, of course, with the turbine mechanical systems, as well as uh, Interact uh, potentially with the aerodynamics, make the aerodynamic interaction uh, complicated. Of course, you have a station keeping system, which is new in in this in this space. Uh, floating people always like obviously stability is the first thing you talk about in the floating design. Make sure it's hydrostatically stable. Uh, Lars will speak to that nonstop. Uh, in the wind sense, because we have such a dynamic system and additional loading that can be important for the wind, uh, we have to consider not just traditional static stability but also dynamic uh, stability uh, type events. Construction and OEM. I often think of just the full system, but obviously you have to build that system. So how is the system uh, structurally stable uh, in, in pieces as it's being assembled? And again, of course, the optimization process in the whole, in the whole, whole loop. I'm not going to really talk much about FAST. Uh, most of the people are, are aware of it, what it is. Uh, what we're really focused on recently is being very modular, uh, so we can have uh, uh, different uh, development it's happening on uh, aerodynamics, structures, controls, and, and having a framework which we can bring all those together uh, to develop uh, a tool that, that is beyond what just a simple, you know, a limited set of funding that NREL can, can, can develop. So uh, we've, we've put together a, a very modular framework, uh, and obviously we have efforts in different, different areas of those, those modules, but really, really trying to establish a community by which uh, people can come and contribute uh, their own uh, physics models into the framework so that it's uh, again, really a multi-fidelity uh, framework tool set. Uh, I have four slides on kind of where I think uh, the, the current state of the art is, 
and where the development needs to happen in the future. I probably don't have time to go through all the details, but I'll try to hit some of the highlights. So aerodynamically, I kind of think of that in these kind of three uh, zones. One is on inflow and array effects. One's on kind of local airfoil aerodynamics. And one's on, on how the rotor responds in sort of a wake setting in the induction. Uh, so kind of standard methods, uh, you know, BEM is the king still in, in the industry, amazingly enough, 100 year uh, old theory. Uh, but it, with BEM and its various corrections, it's still the mainstay in sort of loads analysis type design. Obviously, uh, improved a lot through uh, uh, empirical corrections, uh, high fidelity simulations feeding uh, the data needed to, to tune up those models. Uh, so where I think we're going in the future, uh, on the turbine side, I think a lot of advancement needs to, be, needs to happen on, again, on wind plant interactions. Uh, recently won a project to look at engineering models for wind plant aerodynamics, so taking the dynamic wake meandering, which is kind of the, the industry standard now, uh, making it more parallel so we can do things like uh, wind plant control uh, with aerodynamic interactions. Uh, I think a lot of work on kind of the turbine side would have to be on how high fidelity simulations can, can really be used to improve uh, the corrections in the engineering models, whether it's dynamic stall or, or, or things like uh, blades that are curved, uh, hub losses and tip losses associated with very complex geometries can happen through high fidelity simulations. On the hydrodynamic side, uh, uh, again, I think of it as kind of kind of have the what's coming in, the waves, current. You have, of course, the viscous effects, and you have the potential flow effects for, for small and large bodies. Uh, and so, kind of the state of the art, um, either have some sort of first or second order uh, type hydrodynamic theory, together with a constrained wave to get very high nonlinear uh, events uh, in there. Uh, Morrison's equation, like BEM, uh, is kind of like the state of the art <laughs> or the, the standard approach. Uh, just basically empirically tune hydrodynamic coefficients that apply. And on the uh, potential flow side, it's really WAMIT type potential flow uh, models. Uh, so again, where we think we're going in the future on the wave side, a lot of work on like, how do you really capture both the nonlinearity and the, and the irregularity of waves at the same time uh, is, where, is where the big challenge lies, uh, as well as breaking breaking waves and impact loads. Even on floating systems, uh, there can of course be events uh, such as that that can impact the design. On viscous effects, again, uh, done, we've done a lot of work recently with CFD and, and Matt Lackner's group looking at, you know, sh strip theory, if you just kind of take uh, hydrodynamic coefficients from basic tables of Reynolds number and, uh, and KC number and so on, and you just plug those into the strip theory model, you miss a lot of the interaction effects uh, uh, that, that could happen, whether it's a, a, you know, a shallow drafted member or interaction between members. Uh, so I I'm picture uh, future work looking at how, again, high fidelity CFD type simulations can be used to improve uh, those, those models. On the potential flow side, really moving from kind of small motion assumptions that are kind of the mainstay of oil and gas to how do you handle large motion of the structure that where these uh, potential flow models they break down. Uh, control side, uh, for the sake of time, just to say that uh, kind of looking at new actuators, the new physics of, of the, uh, whether it's LIDARs or, or things like flaps, obviously need to be considered. Structurally, I think uh, structurally is where we really, uh, I think where the models are also already very good, uh, fast. I think we're finally introducing mu much better air elastic capability, actually with a new release coming Monday with, with high fidelity beam, uh, nonlinear beam uh, simulations. But in the future, uh, looking at kind of like new technology areas like, like uh, multi-segmented blades uh, for large offshore structures, uh, drivetrain, marine dynamics, and so on are, are, are critical. My vision for for uh, engineering models is really, again, uh, kind of being able to, to tune the fidelity based on what you need. You need to move away from just single turbine analysis to interactions between uh, turbines in a plant, uh, and uh, really having a framework and a community around behind that to address, address those, those needs. So uh, in summary, uh, engineering tools are core to, obviously, design of floating wind systems and uh, improvements are needed to, to really get to what uh, the visions have been laid out already. Larger sizes, new architectures, uh, uh, wind plant effects, not just turbine effects, and overall system optimization. So uh, 
I know that was fast, but I'd be happy to take any questions at this time. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, you Jason. Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question, and maybe I should pose that one to the group. Um, I mean, I would say certainly on the fixed bottom side, the industry has kind of approached the problem as being able to kind of dissect the design at the you know transition beast level, maybe at the tower top, depending on, on, on who's doing it. So you have the offshore substructure guy doing the, the substructure and the turbine OEM doing the tower and the, and the turbine. Uh, I think that there's certainly advantages to be gained on the fixed bottom system to, to break that barrier, to do system-wide optimization. It will require uh, interaction between the OEMs and the substructure or people. Uh, so I think there's potential on the fixed bottom side, I, and I don't want to mitigate that, but I think on the floating side, it's, it's critical that that happens. So uh, on the fixed system that they've been able to do it without it, and there can be advances made but on the floating side. I think it's critical if you're to meet these cost targets that, that you're talking about. You, you certainly need you need to do that uh, and think of it as a holistic uh, system. So yeah, I mean, I, in terms of how to address the nature of the IP, uh, especially on the controller side, I and mean, we, at NRLD we, we've talked about having much better ways of developing reference models. You know, we've had this NRL five megawatt that kind of everyone uses, but it's very isolated to that sort of architecture and that specific design. Uh, what we've talked about is with our systems engineering effort, being able to automate uh, development of reference models that actually match specific technologies. Like if I want the Siemens six megawatt turbine and I, you know, Siemens won't give me the information I need, uh, I can have, uh, a systems engineering optimization process that will tune sort of reference models to get very, very close to the actual design. Uh, right power curves, right loads, whatever we can get, uh, being able to tune, uh, but on top of that, get the details that Siemens won't be able to share with us, you know, structural details, uh, controller details, and so on. I won't be exact, but it will be as close as we can get without sharing. I mean, I, obviously that, that's a, a step, but it, it gets to where you're uh, trying to go. That basically is how it is done today. I mean, this uh, whether you like it or not, this bladed DLL control interface is kind of the industry standard way of sharing control information. Uh, we're not going to tell you what's in that black box, but it has this, these inputs, these outputs, and, and that standard has already been set. Actually, I really don't like the interface because it, it goes against some of the things I've been trying to push on my framework, but, uh, um, but it, it still is already there. That, that's how we do it when we work with Siemens and other people. Yeah, uh, this is one area that we've been looking at uh, over the last few years is what what is really, you know, we actually had a project with Matt Lackner uh, and, and others, uh, one of his PhD students just graduated, looking at, you know, at least taking that nine-dimensional space and making it down at least five dimensions, something that we can actually get our hands around a bit. And we said, okay, what if we take the full, what's just been everything out, you know, that's 300,000 simulations per seed run a few seeds, that's a lot of simulations, but we have the resources, we can do that. And how do we then pare that down into much simpler, you know, if I just take subspaces of that um, and apply some statistical methods to that, can we get the same answer? And uh, we, indeed, we, we were able to show that. So I think there's, there's definitely ways around addressing that, that 90 uh, intractable space down to something that's manageable. I just don't, uh, I can think of how to do it for subsets of the problem right now, and I think uh, to get to the, the, big, the big question will require some more more effort, but I def definitely think it's it's doable. Any other questions, Jason? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.